Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you allow us to gather together to deal with your holy world. Father, would you protect us? We pray for the empowering of the Holy Spirit, both upon me and upon the hearers. Protect us, my Lord, that we will be faithful uh, as we read your word, that we will be uh, people that are obedient to you. And that we pray that this study will bring us closer to you through the knowledge of your word and bring conviction of sin and help us in this tremendous process of, sancti of sanctification. And those who do not know you, Father, that they will know you through your word today and that all will be inspired by you, my Lord, to read your love letter that you have sent to us in the scriptures, which are infallible, inerrant, sufficient to give us the plan of salvation. salvation. And it is in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Okay. We begin from the beginning. We have been uh, with the group of men, businessmen, meeting uh, on Friday mornings, every Friday at 7 a.m. And for the last nine years, almost 10 years, we began the study of the Bible from Genesis. And so far after these many years, we arrived uh, in the book of Mark, I believe. Uh, so uh, we are going to do the same thing, but in two and a half hours today, God willing. And then as we, we go as far as we, as God will allow us to do, and then we will uh, continue. Uh, the following in, uh, on August 22nd and, uh, ex, uh, at the same time. Well, you know, the book, uh, the Bible is divided into two main parts. And I am speaking to you, but I also have uh, a number of people online. And eventually, uh, we will uh, be able to reach people that do not even know what the Bible looks like. So this information that I'm giving you is superfluous for you because you know it, but I'm doing all of these things also for the sake of those who do not know the Word of God and the Bible. So the Bible is divided into two parts. The first part is the Old Testament with 39 books and the New Testament with 27 books. And also there are a number of books divided into uh, the, first of all, the Pentateuch, uh, then we'll have uh, uh, poetic books, prophetic books, and uh, also we will have the history books. Uh, we, the whole Bible is really the history of redemption and salvation. And we begin in Genesis, and God willing, we will go through the entire Bible, but then if we have time, uh, the next time that we will meet, we will go into specific books that give us that information so clear of the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament books. Um, it is a joy to be able to go through these books uh, with the assurance that what we are dealing with is infallible and is the word of God. We are not, but he is. So we begin with the creation. 
the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. And in the, in the beginning, uh, we see a, a particular word in creation. And that th those words are in Genesis 1, uh, verse 11, verse 12, verse uh, 24, 25, and, uh, and others. But that particular word is that God created in verse 11, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. According to its kind. When you go to uh, verse 21, uh, you'll see the same word, according to their kind. Verse 24, creatures according to its kind. Uh, 25, according to its kind. According to its kind, twice there. According to its kind, in verse 23, you have that expression three times. Well, that doesn't give, leave any room for evolution. See, uh, the people in evolution believe, especially there is a man who wanted to make, make a marriage between the Bible and uh, evolution theories. His name is uh, Teilhard de Chardin, uh, and it's spelled C-H-A-R-D-I-N. It's a French philosopher of the last century. And he said that God is omnipotent, so he just created the vital principle, which is one cell. And he gave that cell the ability to evolve, and he didn't have to be involved in that anymore. So, and he called that the omega point. I could see Dr. Sproul laughing at that. When we mentioned, I said, ha, 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 the Omega Point. And one Friday afternoon, something exploded, you know, and created all of this out of one cell that evolved. How ridiculous is that? And he works with cause and effect. You know, what is it that caused nothing to explode? But in any event, what we have to tell the evolutionists and Teilhard de Chardin and all his followers is that the Bible is clear on that. He did not create one viral principle, one cell with life and allowed that cell to evolve. He created things of its kind, uh, animals, that will continue to be of its kind. And is, is, there is no room there for evolution from one kind to another. Uh, then we, uh, God created men and, and women, and they asked them to be fruitful and multiply. And again, against the currents of today's uh, ways, uh, he did not create men and men and say, go ahead and multiply is man and woman, clearly and distinctly. Men and woman sin. Sin entered through a man, according to Romans 5. Uh, why? When Eve was the one who ate the fruit first. The reason why, dear husbands, is because Adam was there and he did not protect his wife. So, uh, they sin. And then we have the magnificent plan of salvation in chapter 3, verse 15, called the Pro Proto Evangelium, the uh, promise of the, of the gospel. And God says, 315, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, 
He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It's the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ right there before, uh, before we even began. Um, he announces that the Lord Jesus will come to redeem. Then men, of course, run away from God. And it was God who went after them to save them and then uh, cover them, have to kill an animal to cover them. And the same way is a picture of Jesus dying on Calvary and covering us with his blood. What a picture of redemption. Then, of course, man was created free, with free will. But man sinned and lost his free will. And now man can do nothing but sin. He cannot choose between good and evil until God will regenerate some. And when God gives a new birth to some by the power of the Holy Spirit, those people recover the freedom to choose between good and evil. But not until then. God says you, you will die and he promised, he for, fulfilled his promise because they die spiritually and guess what? They also die human, physically because cells began to die and they began to get old and they began to see these white hair and these wrinkles and things like that. So uh, it's, 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 it's the process of dying. God fulfilled his promise. Then death showed at the door because Cain killed his brother. And then uh, God provided a second replacement for, for Abel in, uh, in the person of Seth. Seth, then you'll see from Genesis the division of two races, the race from Cain and the race from Seth. Seth, uh, of course, uh, is the father of Enosh, and uh, he's the father of Canaan, <clears throat> and then he's the father of uh, Mahalel, and then the father of Enoch, <clears throat> and then Methuselah, the oldest man who ever lived, and uh, and then uh, ob obviously uh, then he was the father of Lamech, and the Lamech was the father of Noah. And we arrive now in chapter six. We are doing well so far. Uh, Noah, uh, God, when, when we arrive in chapter 6, uh, verse uh, 5, God said this, man is totally depraved. It was not Calvin who said that first. <laughs> it was not Martin Luther or Knox. It was God. Then the Lord saw that the weakness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Wow! That our law men fall. Continue bad only, only all the time. Only bad only all the time. So God uh, sent the, uh, the plow and he announced that he was going to, that he was going to destroy the earth. Uh, he saved eight people in that ark and that flood lasted almost 
204 days. It rained for 40 days, yes, but then have to stay um, more time there. And if you count, and I don't have to read this to you because we'll never finish. If you count the days, you're going to discover that it's probably 204 before they came back. And God ordered uh, that um, uh, animals of two pairs of male and female, two animals of each species should get into the ark. And somebody uh, said to Dr. Sproul, uh, I don't believe that, that so many animals that only of two of each kind got in there, that's double. He says, I don't believe that either because they were not only two by two, they were in some cases seven animals of each kind because they have to have something to eat and they have to also uh, offer sacrifices. So you will discover that of the clean animals, there were seven or two. Now, uh, scientists will fight this. Uh, however, the Lord Jesus mentions the flood and mentions the ark and mentions the soul. If the Lord Jesus said so, we believe regardless of what scientist says about it. And then uh, after Noah, uh, Noah had three uh, sons. And uh, those three sons, uh, after the flood, uh, Noah uh, uh, became uh, drunk and uh, the and, 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 and the three sons uh, his descendants, one of them can uh, saw the nakedness of his father and make fun of it. And Noah uh, sent a judgment against the race of them. And then we have, uh, uh, and it was in Can, Canaan was course. It's interesting that Canaan is the son of Can. Uh, then we'll have the different descendants of these three people, and we have uh, obviously the descendants of Shem, which is where we really come from. And Shem has children, and eventually he, uh, the, we come to the place where uh, uh, we see the father of Abraham, and his name is Tara. He, no, the father of uh, of Abraham. I'm trying to read as fast as I can here, and I, but. Abraham lived in what is today Iraq, which is, is, is from the Kalans, is from the, from the place where Babylon is. And uh, this uh, uh, Abraham had three, two brothers, and they live in the land of Ur in Babylon. There, one of the sons, Haran, dies. So the father of Abraham and the other brother move from the south, uh, from Ur, from Iraq, from Babylon, all the way to Syria and they moved to a town called Haran. That town was not there. When they came and encamped there, they named the town uh, uh, under uh, the name of Haran, which is the boy who died, uh, the brother of Abraham who died in, in, um, in Babylon, in Ur. It's, it is interesting that uh, from Haran, 
God called Abraham to go to the promised land, to Canaan. But the Bible says that God called him out of Ur. Yeah, he called him out of Ur under the father of Abraham. He, the family, uh, by the sovereignty of God, moved to Assyria, or Syria, up in Haram, and from there, God called Abraham to go to the uh, promised land. Haram took his, I mean, Abraham took his uh, wife, Sarai, and also took his nephew, Lot. So far, so good. Uh, then, uh, there we find one of the most beautiful passages in the entire Bible, <clears throat> which is, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> chapter 15, verse 17. God promised Abraham a descendant and to be the father of nations, but he did not have children. He was 100 years old. His wife was also old and they did not. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as justification, justification by faith, really. Uh, but he doubted and he says how come i'm going to be a father of nations when i don't have any children what is wrong with this picture and god says let me tell you uh look at the stars look at everything and then he said take some animals cut them in half and he did and the Animal, the, the, the birds wanted to eat, and Abraham was uh, throw, uh, taking away these animals, and eventually the Lord passes through those animals as a torch of fire. And what he is saying is, this is the covenant. I am promising to you that I will do what I promise, and I swear upon myself, it should happen to me what happened to those carcasses, to those animals, if I do not fulfill my covenant. Brothers, this was the favorite uh, verse of Dr. Sproul. When they ask him to sign the Bible, they put, your, put down your, uh, your favorite. He will say, uh, Genesis 15, 17, and people go crazy looking at that. He says, it doesn't make sense, but let me read it to you. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. To your descendants, I have given this land from the river to of Egypt to the great river of the river of Ephrates and so on. But the point is, this covenant stands up to today. And you will see through the Bible the, how that covenant comes up over and over and over again. And I was teaching last night uh, the book of uh, Luke and found out that Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus, mentions the covenant of Abraham when she when the angel, angel when she visits elizabeth after the angel uh, announces the uh, incarnation there of the lord jesus christ this is if anything we should remember is this particular covenant then of course god had made a covenant with noah saying that he will not destroy it, the land again with water uh, of course, later on, he says that he will destroy it by fire. And Peter says that uh, in his. So, Abraham has two children, one Ishmael, which was not the son of the promise, 
and then he had Isaac. Isaac was God asked him to offer him as a sacrifice and he went to Mount Moriah, which is Mount Calvary, and offered uh, Isaac. And when he was ready to kill his son, an angel provided, God provided a substitute. Uh, many years later, uh, when uh, the father, God, sacrificed his son in Mount Calvary, there was no substitute. It was the Lord Jesus himself. What a history. And then Isaac uh, has two children. And the two children uh, are called Jacob and Esau. And the prophets tell us that God said, Jacob, I love, Esau, I love. Hated. It was an amazing thing how God gave that promise to Jacob, and not only gave that promise to Jacob, but changed his name from Jacob to what? Israel, what is where the Hebrews come from in the land and the Israelites. Jacob has 12 children, and those 12 children. Uh, one of them is called Joseph. The brothers sold Joseph. He was sent to Egypt. And there he, by the mercy of God, became the prime minister of Egypt. After he was in jail, accused by Mrs. Potiphar uh, of trying to seduce her when, we, when it was the other way around. In any event, uh, Joseph uh, was used by God to, to protect the Hebrews. It was a famine and the brothers of Joseph and his father end up in Egypt and there he, they live and prosper and there uh, Jacob died and they were prosperous until many years passed and the Pharaoh that benefit from the legacy of the Hebrews through Joseph forgot the Hebrew people and they became slaves of the Egyptians and they mistreated them. There is the end of Genesis. Now we begin with Exodus. Exodus, uh, in, in the book of Exodus, you will see that God provides a prophet on the name of Moses. Moses, uh, you know that he was born uh, in a name. And, and, and the Hebrew, uh, the, the Egyptians were trying to kill all the Hebrew children to avoid the reproduction of, uh, of, 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 the, of the Hebrews, the Egyptians' uh, little boys. And Moses survived that, and he was raised in the house of the Pharaoh. Eventually, he had to leave Egypt because he tried to defend the Hebrew people. In the, in the desert, he, there in the desert, he also married, and from there, God called Moses. And he saw this burning bush approach it, and then God said, Moses, Moses, take your sandals, off with your feet because the land that you are stepping in is holy. So God sent Moses to deliver the people from Egypt, the Hebrews. And there is the famous saying, who do I say 
is sending me. And God says his name. Tell them, I am sent you. You will remember in chapter 8 of John, when Jesus said to the Pharisees, I am. So is a clear demonstration that he also used the name of God for himself. And the Pharisees remember that he was talking about the same thing, the same God, Jehovah, 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 Yahweh uh, of the So God sent it to um, Pharaoh. And you know that God also hardened the heart of Pharaoh. That's why he says, I will have mercy upon, I will have mercy and I have compassion upon whom I have compassion and I will harden whatever I want to harden. And of course, I don't have the time to explain what that hardens mean, which is just leaving man to his own will. Uh, in any event, he sends 10 plagues upon the Egyptians, and the last plague is the killing of the firstborn of, and the first male born of the Egyptians. And then uh, Pharaoh begged them to go, and not only begged them to go, but gave them money and things to go to exit. And they left, before they left, they celebrate the first Passover. Uh, 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 um, a lamb had to be slaughtered and the, and the blood put on the doors where the Hebrews were so the angel of death will not attack it. The last Passover was celebrated by the Lord Jesus on a Thursday evening and that was the very last Passover where the lambs that were slaughter uh, there at the before the exodus uh, is the picture of the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world that was slaughtered in calvary so they live and in the desert people rebel, rebel against God and against Moses, and they complain. And you know what? If you read carefully, you are going to see that God sends them 10 plagues. You know, any little plagues that will scare me more than the others. One of the plagues were snakes that would bite them. And that's when in Numbers, uh, God says to Moses, a raise a uh, bronze snake on a tree and whoever looks at the snake even if the snakes will bite them they will not die and then Jesus said in John again John 3 says and the men of and the son of man will be raised up on as the snake was raised on the bronze uh, in the desert and whoever looks at him will not die even if the table bites us. <laughs> you know, we will be saved. Uh, so, in the Exodus, we, we arrive at Exodus 20, where God appears on Mount Sinai. And it is in the peninsula of Sinai Peninsula. And there, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, but not only the Ten Commandments, but he gives him all kinds of instructions on how to build the tabernacle and how to institute the, uh, the sacrifices and, the, uh, and the, the way God wants to be worshipped properly. And then <clears throat> uh, the people of God begin to rebel against God building uh, 
another God while God is on the mountain and the mountain was shaken and God showing his power there. So uh, when Moses comes down, you know the rest of the story, uh, people after all repent, God exercise judgment against uh, the people who uh, sin against him by idolatry. And then the book of Leviticus began. The book of the Leviticus is the book of the ordination of worshiping under the priest. And in the book of Leviticus, God or shows uh, Moses how to ordain the priest and the dignity and the holiness that a priest has to exercise approaching God. And the uh, high priest is established and the, and the first priest, of course, is Aaron and his children and God tells them how to properly worship God. The children of Aaron, you know what happened. They offer sacrifices that were not ordained according to God and God killed them. When Aaron went to Moses and Moses says, I'm sorry, but God is holy, then Aaron put his, his hand on the mouth and say, there's nothing I can say. The high priest was supposed in the day of atonement, in other, other days of uh, ordained in Leviticus, to take the sins of the people and go through the veil of the, of the tabernacle and lay on the temple. And only the high priest could go there, making sure that he had that sacrifices were offered for sins first and then for the sins of the people. And that would happen once a year, the day of atonement. And every year we'll have to do the same sacrifices. And when people sin, people will come to the priest and offer uh, sacrifices that will pay or try to pay for their sins. But this was the way God established as a symbol, as a shadow showing the only high priest that can take away the sins of the world and is the institution of the high priest of the Lord Jesus. When Jesus said at the, on the cross, everything has been completed, what happened? The veil of the temple ripped. So the high priest and all the priests will be totally eliminated because through the veil of the body of Jesus, we can go directly to the Holy of Holies, to God, for the forgiveness of sin through the veil and through the body of the Lord Jesus and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you compare Leviticus to a book in the New Testament, you have to look at the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, if you read it carefully, the priesthood of men is totally eliminated because now there is only one intercessor between God and men, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. And he is still interceding for us at the right side of the Father. Then after the book of Leviticus, with this institution of the priesthood and the uh, different laws of sanctification and so on are uh, described, then we have the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, uh, the God uh, orders uh, 
the Moses to number the people, to know who are they, and, and to keep records of the uh, um, uh, uh, of of the people if they are really Hebrews and how many they come and how many go out. And during that book, you will see things like uh, the again the rebel how people rebel uh, become rebellious against even Moses. Even his own sister becomes rebellious against him. And uh, at one point, uh, people are thirsty. And at one point, God says, go and hit that rock. And he hit it twice, and it was OK. The second time, God says, talk to the rock. And instead of talking to the rock, he said to the people, you rebellious people, you one world, we, did you hear that? We are going to give you water and hit the rock twice. And God has said, don't even hit it, talk to the rock. When he did it, God says, you lost your right to enter the promised land. Because it is not you, but God, that I who gave him water. He took credit and merits. We are going to give you water. We are way too many. The run, the run pronouns. And instead of saying he will give you water, he said we. And that little word destroyed the right for him to enter the promised land. Then after the book of Leviticus, uh, we have the book of, uh, after the book of Numbers, we have the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is called Deuteronomy because it's this, is the second time that Moses mentions again the law. Deuteronomy, uh, of course, is Deu, is two times. And antinomian is, nomian is, nomi, Deuteronomy is the law. So uh, the people, the majority of the people who have come out of Egypt have died. And there is a new generation. So Moses has to begin from the beginning and tell them all the story of the Exodus and all the laws that God had instituted and began to plead with them to keep the law and to be faithful to God and to tell them that they were going to enter into the promised land. He sent uh, uh, spies to the land of Canaan and only two were faithful. The other one returned and discouraged the people from going into the, into the promised land. And instead of going to the promised land to the south, they have to go around and go through the Moabites and to uh, the uh, land which today is the country of Jordan to go uh, through the other side. In Deuteronomy, God uh, tells, uh, uh, elects for uh, Moses a successor, and that is Joshua. And uh, tells Moses that he is going to die, and of course, Aaron also died, and Eleazar uh, is one of the new priests. Finally, in what today is Jordan, God announces to Moses that he is going to die, takes him to the Mount Nebo, which is a mount on Jordan, and says, Moses, look. And from there, Mimi and I were there. And we actually saw this clearly. I guess you were there. And from there, you can see from the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, all the way down to the Dead Sea. And if you stretch your side, you will see the Mediterranean Sea. So, God said to Moses, look at the promised land. 
And the Bible says that he had good eyes and he saw it. He says, but you cannot go in there. Moses died and God buried Moses. And we don't know where Moses is buried because if we knew or the people knew, they would have made an idol of Moses in that tomb. And then uh, the rains are passed to Joshua. Joshua walks into the promised land. He is the one who takes the people to the promised land. And the first thing that happens is that he uh, extends his hand or his, um, how do you call it, rod under, over the waters. And guess what? The waters divide and the river holds the water and all the people pass through the river. That sounds familiar? That's what happened in the Red Sea. It comes out and the first thing that he does is offer sacrifices and a Christophany appears there uh, as the captain of the army and Joshua said, are you for us or against us? And uh, he discovered that he is a messenger from God. When the people heard that the armies of Joshua had crossed through the Jordan, they became very afraid. Fear kills people. That's why they tried to put fears upon us. <laughs> the fears. And the first city that he conquers is Jer Jericho. And you know the story of Jericho, that it was not really Joshua who conquers Jericho, it was God by singing. That's why I'm afraid of the choir. You know, they go around the, 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 the walls and after seven days, and we were there, we saw that the walls fall from outside in. So no one outside will be hurt. <laughs> and they walked in and they conquered this land and then God tells them, do not take anything, any idols or anything like that, but one man took a little idol. They then went to fight against I, I, and there they lose that battle. And Joshua said, how could be? And is the saying there is sin in the camp. And they discovered that this man had carried this idol and Joshua had to kill him and his entire family. And then Joshua conquers the land. No, really. He divides the land upon uh, the 11 tribes. And you know that the Levites don't get anything because the other 11 tribes are supposed to support the Levites. And uh, he conquers a lot of land, but much land was not conquered yet. But he divided, and then after he divided the land, he says, go ahead and conquer it yourselves. And they had to do it. It was not that, that Joshua just turned them over to them free and clear. They had to go and fight. And then Joshua dies. And when Joshua dies, at the end, uh, he also pleaded with them that they should obey the Lord. And he says that famous line, uh, choose who you serve. But as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Joshua dies and several years pass by and people forgot the Lord and forgot everything and they did as they pleased, whatever was good on their eyes. So they cry out to God and God sends them judges. And you have there uh, almost, I guess, over 14 judges 
and you have their Sanson and Kirian and Deborah and uh, Jephthah and all these. Uh, anyone who says that the Bible is boring, <laughs> you know, they should, the kids love these adventures. You know, you have to uh, read it with, with enthusiasm of all the things that God is. And uh, the, the four R's always appear. First of all, rebellion. People rebel. Then God applies discipline, you know, re reaction against their sin. And then they repent. And then God restores them. And it's the cycle. And any time uh, they sin, then they cry out to God, now what will we do? And he sends them another judge and so on. And the last judge is actually Samuel. Uh, but before Samuel, uh, we have uh, also Eli. But before we get to Eli, uh, between Judges and Samuel, we have a little parenthesis. We have the lovely story of Ruth. Ruth uh, is uh, a Moabite. She's not a Hebrew. And there is a famine in Bethlehem. And Noemi, no Noemi? Uh, goes with her husband, Naomi, go, uh, Spanish, uh, goes to the land of Moabite to find food, and there her husband and her two sons die. But one of the sons was married to Ruth, and Ruth said to Naomi, I will go with you. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. So he comes, Naomi comes back, tired, older, without the beauty salon where they can put some makeup on her to see her friends, all friends. And there, and Naomi uh, has a relative by the name Bo, Boaz. And this relative was in falls in love with Ruth, and he is supposed to buy the land, to buy back the land that belonged to Naomi. And of course, uh, whoever buys the land will have to marry Ruth. And Boaz managed to get that deal and marry uh, Ruth, and out of Ruth and Boaz comes, what's his name? Obed, who is the Ruth, becomes the, the grandmother, great grandmother of David. So not this interesting thing. From the line of, of Rehab, which is a prostitute in Jericho, comes Jesus. And now from the line of a pagan, which is uh, Ruth, uh, comes the line, the genealogy of Jesus. And then um, uh, there is a reason that for that parenthesis. And then comes the book of Samuel. The first book of Samuel, uh, Samuel tells the story of one of the last judges, which is Eli. Eli gets into the battle with the Philistines and they lost the Ark of the Covenant with the Philistines. When uh, Eli comes, when the, no, the news comes to Eli that his sons who were, who were corrupted and Eli himself was corrupted, uh, have lost the battle and that the Ark was also lost, Eli fell back, died, and uh, the wife of one of his children gave birth, and the name of the child was Akaba, the glory of the Lord. 
has moved out of Israel. Then Samuel becomes the judge. And at one point, uh, the people of Israel are jealous of the kingdoms around them. And they would like to have what? A king. And God says, a king is going to destroy you. A king is going to do horrible things to you. Don't do it. And Samuel says, that's what they want. He said, well, don't worry. They are not rejecting you. They are rejecting me as their king. So Samuel finds Saul. And you have the list of the kings there with you, but we will get there. Uh, Saul is, is chosen by God as a judgment, really, uh, to the Hebrews, and he becomes the first king. Uh, Saul, at one point, starts from God. And, and instead of going to God for counsel, he goes to a uh, witch. The witch will tell him that he will die with his sons. And he said that he, and she said that it was Samuel who said that. You know, don't believe that for a second because uh, the dead will not come back. So, uh, that was what she said. It looks like an old man, it looks like Samuel. But uh, at this moment, Saul was dealing with demonic powers, with witches. And so he, uh, loses his life, but before he dies, uh, God already uh, had chosen a new king, and that was David. David served Saul as a young man while Saul was still the king, and Saul began to persecute David. Uh, and almost kill him. David had the opportunity to kill Saul several times, but he will not touch the uh, man who has chosen by God, the anointed of the Lord. And when finally, even when he died, uh, the person who came to give him the news, he said that he was the one who killed Saul uh, and gave him the crown as, you know, uh, making himself famous, he says, you just lost your life. How dare you raise your hand against the anointed of the Lord? <clears throat> so David becomes king. David uh, promised to build the temple of the Lord. Uh, promised and, and, and succeed is one of the greatest kings of Israel, of the United Kingdom. And eventually Saul falls into sin and he commits adultery with Bathsheba and kills the Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba on the war and lies to the people and finally marries Bathsheba uh, to look good in the kingdom. And God goes after David. It's not David that goes after God. God sends Nathan, the prophet, to David and he says, there is a man who is very rich and he did not kill one of his many lambs, but he stole a little lamb from a poor man and killed it and ate it with his friends. And David said, that man should die. He pronounced the judgment against himself. Nathan says, you are that man. What did David said? Responded with Psalm 51. 
against God and God alone I have sinned. Have mercy upon me. You are right if you judge me and send me to hell. But I claim to your mercy. Against God and God alone I have sinned. Clean me with Isaac. Give me a new heart so I can proclaim the same to others. And so he repents. And, we, and the Bible says <clears throat> that David is, goes after the, is, is men after God's heart. Then uh, David cannot build the temple because the Lord says, no, you have laid too much blood. It's, it is interesting that in that meeting with Nathan, Nathan says, okay, you are not going to die. But the consequences of sin will be heavy on your house. And it was. Even his sons rebelled against him. It's, it was a nightmare because of the sin. Sin is serious. And especially uh, sins of adultery has destroyed so many people, houses, uh, people, uh, families, kingdoms, uh, you name it. Uh, and then he said, you cannot build my temple. You have way too much blood. But your son will do. So David prepared all the necessary things and even plans for the building of the temple. And then comes uh, Solomon. But notice that out of Bathsheba comes Solomon, which is part of the genealogy of Jesus. A woman, an adulterous woman, is the great, great, great grandmother of Jesus. When we see this, dear ones, when we see this, we see the humiliation of the incarnation. He didn't come to palaces with pure, decent people. He was incarnate in humble, between sinful people. You know, that's why Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, uh, what we could not do, God did by sending his son in what? In the likeness of sinful flesh. Not a sinful flesh, but in the likeness. Because he came already from the line of very sinful people. Well, enough of preaching. Now, David <laughs> uh, has Solomon, and Solomon comes into the kingdom. Solomon begins well, builds the temple, I encourage all of you to read that prayer of Solomon when he builds the temple. It is an amazing, an amazing picture to see uh, when he prays and the glory of God comes into the temple. It is, it is a magnificent picture of uh, of of the glory of God. But then Solomon falls into sin. He marries many women, foreign women. He becomes rich, he imports horses and all of that. Uh, but in Samuel, you see that when, the, when, when Solomon was born, it says Samuel that God loved Solomon. And when God loves somebody, he won't take his love away. In fact, in the book of Kings, you don't see any repentance on Solomon, but keep reading and you are going to see Ecclesiastes where he claims that all the sin that he did was vanity, but nothing more than vanity. And you can see the repentance. Solomon slaved his people to a certain point. It is really cruel, but at the end, Obviously, he repents. He also writes a beautiful song, Song of Sons, that I will love for every husband and every wife 
to read it and to and to share that beauty of the poetry and compliments to each other in that book. But we will get there, don't worry. Uh, that's part of our study. Because in that, I probably spend some time because you don't want me to skip through that. Uh, then you, it comes the division of the kingdom. Solomon has a son, and the son is more cruel than he is. People complain to his son, uh, or Solomon, who is um, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And you have it in this paper that you have there. Rehoboam is the first king of the south, and when they came to him and said, will you have more compassion upon us than your father? He says, if my father, if the, if the was managed with the little finger, um, my, my little finger will be my entire body upon you. So they divided 11, uh, 10 tribes flee to the north under another king called Jeroboam. And, and the kingdom is divided. We don't have more a United Kingdom. In the north, you have uh, Israel, uh, with the capital of Israel being um, Samaria, and in the south, Judah, with the capital of Jerusalem. Rehoboam did not do well. And Jeroboam, Pardon me. And Jeroboam in the north did worse. He created a play, places of worship, idolatry, so people will not be enticed to go back to, to uh, worship at the temple because he was afraid that he was going to lose the kingdom. And then you have a division of kings, and there are about 40 kings, 20 in the north and 20 in the south, and you have the list there that maybe um, the, um, our friends in Medellin can put it on the, and, and you can see the list of, uh, of, the, of the kings, and you will see that in the south, there is a number of kings that do well and there are kings that do very, very bad. But besides the list of kings, you will see the prophets that were working during the time of those, uh, of those periods of the kings were there, both of the north and the south. In the north, there were also 20 kings, and none of them did well. All of them became corrupted and they uh, reign until the year uh, in the north. They reign until the year 612, more or less. And then they were, pardon me, they reign until the year 716, 700 and, uh, 600 and 87 or something like that and then Israel was taken into captivity to the Assyrians. Assyrian uh, destroyed that king and then the, king, the kingdom of the south continue uh, to live and they did, some did well, some did bad and those uh, 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 that the kings were actually Judea, Judah was taken into exile in the year 597, 586 or so. So then we enter here into the uh, book of the kings, uh, king book one and book two. And you are going to see that some of the kings actually have similar names. This chart 
will be very good for you to keep because you will see so clearly uh, on the book of Kings. They are taken into the exile while they were in Jerusalem and both in Samaria, uh, in Judah and Israel. They had plenty of prophets calling upon repentance, calling upon the people to do right, and they ignore, therefore, God sent them to the exile, first of all through Syria and then through Babylon, and it was taken to the land of the Chaldeans. So in that way, you finish uh, the uh, first and second book of Kings, and then comes the book of Chronicles. The book of Chronicles, don't you find this Bible exciting? It's, it's so, you know, some people say, I don't read the Bible because I just don't understand, or I don't read the Bible because it's so boring, or, you know, just keep reading. And it's an amazing, amazing story of redemption and the mercy of God upon us. The book of Chronicles was written probably at the return of the exile. It's probably written by Ezra or, Ezra or by, you know, I, we don't know who, but it's coming back from the exile. And that was approximately in the year 538, when they spent 70 years, 70 years in the exile, according to uh, the prediction of Jeremiah. So, the book of Chronicles was written to tell the story to the new people who were going to begin again under Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah in the, uh, in the uh, prophets that came, Hegel and uh, Zachariah and Micah, uh, uh, who came with the people from the exile. The Chronicles is written to show more the kings and the life under the kings in Judah more than Israel. So it is easier to read. And it goes all the way, all the way to Adam. It's very interesting, the story of redemption on the Chronicles. And uh, the book of Chronicles show also the sin of the people in uh, Israel and the sin uh, of uh, uh, and how many times the prophets called them, called them to be pure and to obey and to follow the rules that God has established for their own. Um, notice that in Chronicles 1, it begins with the word Adam. And you see again the genealogy, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahal, and so on. And then why? Because Ezra and the people who came back from the exile wanted to have to be pure, to have really the race of the Jewish people without any intervention of the Samaritans, without any intervention of the nations that have caused Israel to sin and to take them into idolatry. And they wanted to make sure that they will know their history and they will know their God and they will know uh, uh, how to behave and prosper again. So after the book uh, of first and second book of Chronicles, then we have Ezra. Ezra, uh, you remember he was in, in the exile uh, under the kings of Babylon, under Nebuchadnezzar and all these people, but eventually the middle Persians invade Babylon, the Chaldeans, and they take over under a person called Cyrus. And Cyrus was mentioned by name 
almost 200 years before this happened uh, by Isaiah. It's, it's an amazing story. This Bible has to be true because how in the world somebody will be able to tell with such a precise information so many years before? Uh, so when the persons, persons uh, take over, then Ezra is one of the people who serves the king and one day he comes and the, uh, the king will, uh, will tell the king the problems that is going on in the old land uh, where at the exile you know that Jerusalem was totally destroyed, the temple was destroyed, it was in shambles, uh, and when we get to the prophets, we will see more of this in what happened with Jeremiah and all these people who were still there. I think we need to take a break. Uh, so it is now 10, 15. Uh, should we go for 10 more minutes? Can we do it? 10 more minutes? Or well, take a break. Uh, take a break. Uh, let's take a break for 15 minutes and then we come back uh, and, and, and continue with Ezra and Nehemiah and see the fantastic history of the new beginning. They come back from the exile and then they have to rebuild the temple, they have to rebuild the city, they have to rebuild the walls, and they have to rebuild their souls. They have to know to obey God. And you will see the wonderful thing that Ezra, uh, Ezra, I say Ezra is in Spanish, Ezra discovers the law. Well, not discover, gives them the law and the Bible. And people are excited about this Bible. They spend almost days standing up listening to it and learning. But we will learn more after the break. Let's take uh, 15 minutes and then we'll come back.
Okay. Come on. Very good. Okay, we continue. We were coming back from the exile and we came back. Is something I'm plugged in? Oh, okay. Um, it's a make believe camera. Okay. Uh, we came back from the exile with Ezra. Uh, first of all, es es Ezra comes uh, first and he uh, begins to build the temple. And in that time, you have Haggai and Zechariah and other prophets saying, you guys forgot to, be, uh, to work on the temple of the Lord. They get a lot of people trying to help him from the Samarians. And, he, and they say, no, we want to keep the purity of the people. We don't want to mix again with pagans. And so they get into a lot of trouble. Um, Ezra uh, reads, he's a priest, so he reads the Bible to the people, discovers again, and, and pleads for the purity of the priest and the, and, 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 the, and, the uh, and he builds the temple again, and of course people cry out because uh, they are joyful to see the temple again on one hand and on the other hand they compare to the original temple and there is no comparison. They, they know that it's not as glorious as the previous temple but the history of uh, Israel continues there and we are approaching the year 400 where the Old Testament ends and there is again 400 years from the year 400 until the first year when we'll see again John the Baptist. God is silent. Then after Ezra, uh, Nehemiah is sent also by the Persians, uh, uh, kings, to come and build the walls. And again, Nehemiah finds a lot of opposition both from the Samarians and the rest of the people around, but he succeeds and builds the walls and builds, and they divide the land again, and they give them again the rules, and they give them uh, the, the law, and they, and they tell the people that the reason why they were in exile is because they are sin and they don't want to repeat these same problems. Uh, after Nehemiah uh, comes uh, Esther. There is a little parenthesis there where even within the Persians and, uh, and the Mids and the Persians, they will like, there is a king who is enticed to destroy, to uh, uh, annihilate the race of the Jewish people, the Hebrews. Esther, by the sovereignty of God, marries uh, the king. And uh, with, through a series of events, the fellow who wants to kill the Jewish people ends up being uh, hanged. And Mordecai, Mar Mordecai, 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 I have to, my notes are in Spanish. Uh, Mordecai, uh, who is the uncle of Esther, uh, becomes, by the providence of God, uh, the person who actually protects the Jewish people. After Esther comes a magnificent book that many people read it when they are suffering. It's the book of Job. But guess what? I like to suggest to all of us that we read it when we want to know the attributes of the Holy God. I, I haven't seen a, a book more complete 
showing the attributes of God is, is like the proper theology when we study who God is. God allows Job, who is very rich and blessed, to suffer under the attack of Satan. And Satan is trying, the devil is trying to make Job reject God and rebel against the Holy God. And he doesn't naked I came into the world, naked I bless he is holy in his name. Says, no one who is just. Even though you are a good person, but intense, but there is nothing. And in chapter 38 to four and uh, on, and God decides, decides to speak. And guess what God says? He talks about himself, himself, his attributes, his power, his honor. His glory, and then uh, restore a job to uh, to the place where he was, and even with more riches uh, than before. And then we have the book of Psalms. As you see, when we begin with Job, we begin with the poetic books. Uh, if anything, I wish sometimes I speak English, because when you see the beauty of the language in Job, the richest of the poetry and the literature and the figures of a speech, you make sure that when you read it, you have sweet, soft music, you know, really laughing and enjoying because it's really poetry. Uh, then after the book of Job comes the book of Psalms. We have the book of Psalms called from the year 1450. So uh, then, uh, to the 450, because uh, the, one of the first writers is Solomon. You have uh, some psalms written by Solomon, over 70 are accredited to David, and there are songs of every kind of, uh, every kind of gender. Uh, it has uh, in, in purpose, uh, Prayers, complain, uh, um, repentance, uh, the vivid picture of the Lord Jesus, and so on. Uh, you remember Psalm 1, uh, that is, it, it, it gives us uh, the idea of how to work in sanctification. Uh, I don't want to walk with evil people. I don't want to sit with them. I don't want to look at things that are improper, and so on. Uh, then you go to other Psalms uh, where are messianic, <clears throat> like Psalm 22. Psalm 22, if you have the opportunity, read it, and you see the videotape of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. You know, it says, he says exactly the same words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That sounds familiar? That's the, the way Psalm 22 begins and, and shows that. Then in the Old Testament, God has a judgment against the false uh, pastors and shepherds. So here you have in Psalm 23, I am the good shepherd. And Jesus in John 10 said, I am the good shepherd, the sheep know my voice, and I know my sheep by name. And uh, then you have the Psalm of Repentance that we talk about, Psalm 51. Remember that one? Uh, against you and you alone I have sinned. Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose sins are not being counted. Why? Because everything all of our sins had been uh, transported transport to the body of Jesus and God, with his wrath that was coming after us, charged his wrath upon the body of the Lord Jesus, who was carried with our sin. Uh, then you have uh, Psalm uh, 91, 
which is a magnificent song. Uh, also, Psalm which says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, and uh, then you have the Psalms uh, 119, which is the longest uh, uh, psalm. And it is all about the Bible, the beauty of the Bible. How I love your law. Um, psalm 118 is placed in the middle <laughs> in the middle of the Bible, there is exactly the same number of verses from there, from 118, 18 to the end. And if you count backwards, it's exactly the same number of verses. So it's just an interesting thing. It's like I wanted to tell you that the Bible was written, began to be written when was Columbus discovered America. Not so. It was in 1492, really, but it was before Christ. He was 40 years old when he began to write the Bible, Genesis and the rest. And of course, he copied from traditions and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay, don't, I hope they don't expel me from this church for saying things like that. But that's, that's what we try to figure out through figuring dates. Uh, there are psalms that are messianics. In the Psalm 110, the Lord Jesus mentions that psalm over and over again in comparison. Psalm 118 also is messianic and so on. So uh, some people say that they don't know how to pray. Uh, psalms is a tremendous way to pray. I want to say something for the people who are online. And some of you might not be Christians. And you think that by reading the Bible, by reading the Psalms, you are going to be saved. I have bad news for you. You Psalms can give you courage and enjoyment and all of that. But if you don't trust in Christ alone for your salvation, if you don't know that your sins are forgiven because you believe that Christ is the Son of God, and by trusting in him, all your sins are forgiven. You can read as many Psalms as you can, but that doesn't give you salvation. You read Psalms because you are a child of God and you know that you are safe and brings you so much joy and in much contact with God. I don't know why I say that, but I find people who have their Bibles open in Psalm 91 or other Psalms, but they never read it. And that's the most dangerous thing to have, to have the word of God right in front of your face and never read it and to arrive in, it, arrive in eternity. And when God asks you, did you read my love letter? And you say, I just read some Psalms. It doesn't work that way. In any event, we go from Psalms to another, uh, uh, part of po uh, uh, poetry, which is the Proverbs. And the Proverbs, again, uh, some of them are written by Solomon, but there are many people who wrote the Proverbs. And the Proverbs also give us a lot of information and guides for sanctification. Remember, we are justified once for all when we trust in Christ alone. And we trust in Christ alone when the Holy Spirit convicts our heart, believe in the heart, and confess with the mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. And that happens because God has called the ones that he has predestined before the foundation of the world, when we are in front of his word, and the Holy Spirit gives us a new birth, a new regeneration, a new regeneration, period. So Proverbs, uh, it's a number of sayings that they used to say in the mid, in the in the uh, on the east and the Middle East, uh, and they uh, they put it together, and they uh, of course they are uh, very much uh, they are very much they are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and you have a proverbs uh, of wisdom where it shows the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as the wisdom. It shows uh, Proverbs that will teach men purity 
and again and, 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 and tells them be careful be careful because impurity and uh, uh, can kill you uh, drink from your own fountain and your own system uh, then you have uh, proverbs uh, that uh, read gives joy to a husband like Proverbs 31, the most beautiful woman in the entire world that God has given to someone is his wife. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the way it should be for every single husband in this world. And soon we will get to a, to a song of songs and we'll deal a little bit with more that beautiful. But Proverbs really is a guide to for sanctification. Some people read one proverb per, per day. And then, of course, since there are 31 proverbs in the months that have taken only 30 days, they have to read two proverbs in one day to complete. And then we have Ecclesiastes. In this book, it seems to be is written by Solomon. And when you read it, again, excellent poetry and beautiful poetry. Uh, then you see Solomon repenting, say everything is vanity. If you don't have God, you can have everything. I have done everything, I taste everything, and nothing, nothing satisfy you eternally. And um, and he and even the birds made a song about that. You know, there's the time to be born and the time to die and time for this and time for the other. So uh, that's taken from Ecclesiastes. Then Solomon seems to be written the book of the Song of Songs. And again, that book, ah, I wish I have the ability to learn those words. You know, and sing them to my nini uh, every day. You know, uh, they one of these songs says, "You are almost as beautiful as my horse." <laughs> <laughs> you you are like a mountain full of of, of uh, goats, and and so and we laugh about it. What happens is that Solomon loved horses and he had thousands of horses. He would care, he says, if you look at a horse and see the ability of those animals and the way they, they are beautiful. So he wanted to express beauty. But the beauty of this book is that Bob, the husband, expressed so much love for the wife and the wife for the husband is proper. God had created that. And there is an expression that really, uh, I present this workshop in Latin America. Uh, so far, we have over 12,000 people in the different line uh, to tune in. And when they write to me, it says, I spend almost 45 minutes in Song of Sons. And they say, some of them wrote to me and say, you just fix my marriage. <laughs> because it's beautiful. It is an expression of tenderness. You know, believe me, ladies would like to hear appreciation from the husband and, 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 and wants to, and husbands would like to also uh, be honored and, and to see that if, in my case that I don't know how to do anything with my hands, when I am able to put a nail on the floor, well, on the, on the floor, on the wall, I, I want to be appreciated because I don't know how to do that. Well, so, but Song of Songs, you need to read it. Now, it says, many theologians say that the Song of Songs is really a relationship between God and his church. Jesus and his church. It is true. But it's also a hymn of the love that God has given to men as a gift 
which is the love between husband and wife, and wife and husband. Well, enough of the some sounds other verse will never finish. I'd love to stay this one for at least two hours more, but then we come to Isaiah. Isaiah is an educated man, a prophet, and now we walk into the prophets. And Isaiah uh, lives in the year probably 750. Uh, for your information, that was the year in which Rome was building, built, was founded. You know, so you can make comparison. Um, Isaiah sees the glory of God and the, when he sees the glory of God in chapter 6, he says, woe is me a sinner. And God goes, touches his lips, cleans him up, and touches his lips as he touched his, our lips with the gospel. And he says, now, he says, should, who should I send? And he says, here I am, send me. And he says, go, but they will not hear you. They don't have eyes to see or ears to hear until my sovereignty will give them those ears. Amazing, Jesus quotes Isaiah about that so many times when we talk about predestination and election. When he teaches about the parables, he says, why they don't understand? Because Isaiah said this. Because, and then in Isaiah comes the Lord Jesus. In chapter 7, uh, in chapter 9, that the virgin will give birth uh, to, uh, to, to a child. And then uh, he says he shall be called counselor, one, the prince of peace, and others. And then he uh, continues to give a vivid uh, explanation of what the Lord Jesus is and what he's coming to. And in chapter 52 and 53, he shows him as the substitute for our sin. He was, uh, he was, uh, it pleased the Lord to crush him for our sin. And if you read that, ah, I wish I had three or four hours just to explain that. Because at least 12. Let me say that so you can catch me on my exaggerations or my lack of exaggeration. But I believe it's around 15 times that you'll see the substitution of the Lord Jesus on the cross for our sins. Uh, he was for our transgressions, for these, for these, for us. And I'd like you to read it and see it. And then Isaiah writes uh, chapter 61, verse 1 to 3, 1 to 4. And the Lord Jesus quotes that psalm, that um, chapter in Nazareth when they give him the papyrus to read. And he opened that roll and finds and reads about him. And he says, Today, this prophecy has been fulfilled, is about me. Wow! <laughs> it's an amazing thing, all about the Lord Jesus. Uh, and when you hear the song, the Handel's Messiah, come for my people, come for my people, you feel like singing and say, hallelujah, because all of that, uh, shows the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have Jeremiah. Are we going to pass? <laughs> Jeremiah is chosen by God to uh, ask the people of Judah to repent. And he tells them to repent and repent. And instead of that, the kings and, the, and the, they hit him and they put him in a system with water and they... Uh, they mistreat him so much. Not only everyone. He only had maybe one or two friends, Baroque and, and somebody else. He didn't have that many. Up to the point that he said, oh God, why don't you kill me? 
I don't want to work for you any longer. I'm sorry. I don't quit it. And then he says, but in my heart, a burn that desire for the Lord, and he will continue because he had placed that. In his, it reminds me of the mission that we have uh, with SRL. 20 years, and sometimes I want to run, and I, bring, but there is that burn fire in my heart. And I am also afraid of the fish that might be eat me up if I walk out of the house and take me back to Nineveh. So uh, for that reason, I don't, I don't quit. But the same thing happened to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah kept saying things like, people are saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And then he tells them, repent, and they turn. And he uh, actually sees when the king of Babylonia uh, takes uh, the king of Judah in, into exile. He is left in Jerusalem, and they force him to go down to Egypt. And he says, don't go to Egypt, stay here. And he takes, tells the people who are going to the exile, go ahead and cultivate the land and live well, because you are going to be there for 70 years. And the people almost kidnap him to Egypt. And they promised him that they were going to follow his uh, suggestion that to stay in Jerusalem. And after that, that they promised that they will do it, they decided to worship someone that you don't have any idea who it is. Who is it? Chapter 7, 18, and also in chapter 44 is the queen of heaven. Wow. And in Jeremiah says, it is another God, it's an idol. And they say, wow, when we were making cakes to the queen of heaven, things were doing well with us. And now that we are not, we, uh, we, uh, they, they, they are involved in idolatry. Uh, you know that there are churches that have a queen of heaven as somebody that they care about. And I have to tell you, the queen of heaven in the Bible is an idol, okay? And the Mary of the Bible, our beautiful Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus, is not the same of that Mary that some churches want to make into an idol. I hope that you understand that. I don't go any farther because otherwise I will change my entire lesson today to other things. So uh, Jeremiah uh, sees the destruction of Jerusalem and then he walks in Jerusalem and cries a lamentation over Jerusalem, over the total destruction, is a poem uh, that if you don't know what you are talking about, if you read the Book of Lamentations and you don't read, you read the rest of the Bible, it's a boring and ugly and, you know, a sad thing. But when you are reading it within the context of what happened, you say, whoa, this was a beautiful city. What happened? And uh, so we arrive at the Book of Lamentations, and from there we go to the next prophet. The next prophet is Ezekiel. Ezekiel had been taken to the exile, and he is in the exile. He is in Babylon. When he, uh, when he prophesies, the first thing that happened in chapter one, he sees the glory of God in Babylon. Chapter one. Chapter two, there is a messenger from God that takes the role of the Bible, the papyrus, and tells Ezekiel, eat it. Take and eat it. And he says, okay, he eat it and say, let it go into your veins, into your heart, into every part of your being. And don't be pagan 
like the rest of the people. Read your Bible, not only read it, but live it and enjoy it and be a child of God. Because if you don't have that, you don't have a story to tell. And then he said, go and tell the people in exile to continue to repent that I am the God that is still with you. But guess what? They will not hear you. They will not understand. They will not care. In fact, it's as if you are sitting on a scorpions. If, if, if looks could kill, you will be dead. And that's what happened with us when we present the gospel. And when he's in the midst of that, the helicopters comes up, picks up Ezekiel, and takes him to Jerusalem. The Spirit of the Lord <laughs> takes uh, Ezekiel to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he shows him all the sins of the priest and how horrible it is. And he shows the temple. And he shows uh, Ezekiel that they had brought idols into the temple. And he sees the glory of God leaving the temple and going for a while on top of a mountain to the east of Jerusalem is Mount Olives, the Mount Olives. And the glory of God stands there for a little while and then continues. You see, it is interesting that in chapter 24 of Matthew, when Jesus leaves the temple for never to come back, People say, look at those buildings, how beautiful they are. And they're right, they're buildings, they're not temple anymore. Because Jesus has left the temple as the glory of God has left those buildings. And Jesus said that there was now a stone left upon a stone. And then from the temple, Jesus goes to where? To the Mount of Olives to continue to teach the disciples. What a comparison of the glory of God in Ezekiel and God himself living in the temple. And then uh, the helicopter, the spirit, takes him, takes him back 900 miles, 800 miles to Babylon. And then he continues to preach to the people there. And eventually another helicopter takes him back to Jerusalem with the Holy Spirit. And now he sees the renewal of Jerusalem. He sees the building of the new temple, the building of everything. And see, and he also sees now the glory of God coming back to the temple. He's all excited. And then he hears a trickle of water coming from the temple. He runs, he tries to run through the east gate and the angel says, no, that's only for God. So he goes to the north, goes around and see the trickle of water. The trickle of water becomes a brook, and then it becomes larger and larger, and a river that he cannot even swim in there. And this river goes to all over the world, bringing life is the gospel, going everywhere and going to all the nations. So that's the way the gospel, the uh, Ezekiel ends. After Ezekiel comes a very interesting book, the book of Daniel. Daniel uh, is also in the exile. He was taken with Ezekiel and, what, uh, and with the, uh, the first king that was taken in exile. And there uh, he sees, uh, he, he behaves well, the dietary uh, rules that uh, the Jewish people were supposed to keep, he is keeping them. And um, then through a series of circumstances, um, uh, the, 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 the king has a dream that no one could guess what it was. And the reason why no one could guess is because the condition that the king gave is that in order for you to, to guess what my dream is all about, you have to tell me first, what is it that I dream? <laughs> that's, that's a tough one. And when he goes in front of the king, he says, oh, so you can interpret dreams. He says, no. There is a God in heaven who 
who does that. He gives the glory to God. And when he's trying to do that, he prays. Daniel, uh, obviously, you know the rest of the story, but Daniel is the one who quotes the word, the son of men, chapter seven, verse nine on. The son of men. And the son of men in Daniel is no one else but God himself, the son of God, the Lord Jesus. That's why Jesus called himself always the son of men. And when you read that and the power of, the, of, those, of that chapter, you are almost in front of Job, looking at all the attributes of the Holy God. That's why Jesus called himself always the son of men. Then you have the beautiful prayer of uh, uh, Daniel in chapter 9, repenting not only for the people who are there, but for the people of Israel that caused all these troubles to get into the exile. And that's chapter 9. Whenever you want to pray uh, and you don't have anything to say, open that. It's a magnificent prayer. And then the Lord gives him some visions, and in those visions, he shows him the history of what is going to happen even until the coming of Jesus and even until the end of the times. But interesting thing is that he shows him uh, four beasts, four kingdoms. He has a ram, and the ram is the Persians who are, who they think that they are extremely powerful until somebody comes from Greece and is Alex, Alex, Alexander, Alexander the Great. And then it comes the empire of the Greeks taking over the Persians. And then Alexander the Great goes on and conquers Palestine. And he dies. I mean, no one could really stand Alexander the Great. And when Palestine is on the Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great dies and he leaves four generals who divides uh, uh, Palestine into four kingdoms and the Seleucians come and they burn a pig in the altar of the temple. Whoa! Whoa! That is the worst insult that you can do to the Jewish people and to God, a holy place. And then the uh, Maccabees revolt. And then it comes another empire. Uh, pardon me, before that was the Assyrians, but finally comes the Roman Empire. And they take over and then uh, it shows the coming of the Lord Jesus during that, and then the um, abomination of desolation indicating uh, 70 AD. It is magnificent. When we talk about the Bible and say, ha, 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 that is a circular argument because the Bible proves the Bible, here you see that history proves, demonstrates the truth of the Bible. Isn't that exciting? Maybe I'm too... <laughs> But it's magnificent. Okay. After Daniel, come. What's his name? Hosea. I say Hosea. 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 God is the in, is God showing his his covenant, his mercy for his people. He asked Hosea to go and marry an impure woman. This woman marries him, and then he, she moves away and runs into all kind of immorality and prostitution. And she ends in the worst of cases, sold as a slave in the open market, naked, destroyed, ugly. And God ordered Hosea to go and buy her. 
you know, when you add the amount that he paid for, it's almost 30 pieces of silver. How did you like that? You know, and buys her back and takes us and, and loved her and said, I'll do this because of my covenant. Well, that's us. That woman is us, the church. We come to Christ and then we go back into sin. And he doesn't let us go. He goes and buys them. And the sovereignty of God keeps us there. That's Hosea. Then, um, obviously, Gomer, which is us, uh, falls into spiritual idolatry, which is the message of uh, prostitution that is called in. Then we come with the uh, prophet Joel, who lived in year 835 or something like that. And he talks about the day of the Lord and the coming also of the Holy Spirit. And interestingly enough, when the Holy Spirit comes in Pentecost, and Peter gives that sermon, he quotes Joel and, 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 and see the coming of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, he has a number of visions uh, uh, and, um, uh, and it's um, uh, Joel uh, also shows how the nation of Palestine uh, is going to be uh, established because of rebellion. Then we have Amos. Amos is a man who is a man who cultivates the land. He doesn't know that much letters, but God called him and he, God calls him to uh, express judgment against the Moabites. The Moabites laugh at the way uh, their, the kingdom of the north was going away and how did they attack the Moabites. And uh, uh, Amos see uh, three visions the, uh, also and finally in the hand of God with measuring the people in the earth. And then after Amos, we have Jonah. Jonah lived in the kingdom of the north, in Israel. And Israel hated is, uh, Assyria, Assyria because they were violent against the Israelites. So Jonah hated also the Assyrians. Oh, pardon me, Obadiah comes before Jonah. Sorry, um, you're right. Obadiah is in the year uh, 850 uh, and 840, and he also gives a judgment against the Aramites. Uh, and, um, uh, and he specifically calls upon the Aramites as the descendants of Esau. And he also makes a relationship between Esau and Jacob. He says, how dare you hate your brother Jacob? It's very interesting. And he uh, has a judgment against the Edomites. Now, but I made my wife happy, I will continue. Um, then Jonah, uh, the Lord sends him as a minister of the gospel to Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria. He doesn't want to go. He hates them. So instead of that, he buys a nice ticket, first class, you know, and goes to another city. And God punishes him, and he gets thrown out of this ship because of the turbulence of the water and ends up on the uh, belly of a fish. Many scientists says that that is impossible. Jesus says it is possible because he mentions Jonah as Jonah was three days in the fish saw the son of man. So it's interesting <clears throat> that I will take the word of Jesus over any scientist. 
the same thing there. So he ends up, and if you want to read a prayer, that's the prayer that Jonah did in the belly of the fish. It's very interesting. You can taste every single word. It tastes almost like fish. Well, no. <laughs> but it's really wonderful, that, that prayer. And then uh, he sends him as a missionary. He says, okay, 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 I go, I go, I go. From the belly of the fish, he say, okay, okay, I do whatever you say. And he went through the city and proclaimed the gospel. He says, Nineveh will be destroyed in 40 days. And guess what? To his big surprise, they repent. And he gets angry. Can you imagine if they send me as a missionary and everyone believes that I get angry because of that? That's exactly how miserable we are. This is just the human nature. And then after that, he uh, goes into a little hill, makes a little uh, place to sit down and wait for the city to be destroyed. And instead, everyone repents and he gets angry at God. So God teaches a little lesson. He says, okay, you are hot there, and it's horrible, and things like that. Let me make you a little plant overnight, and it covers you with the plant. And he says, thank you, very good. Now I'm, I can live there forever. It's great. And at night, a, a worm, God sends a worm, the sovereignty of God. Uh, George told me to mention the sovereignty of God, so here it is, you know. And uh, it's the plant, and he gets angry at God again. He said, not only you didn't destroy that, but you destroyed my little plant. He says, are you kidding? Jonah, you get angry for a little plant that you didn't work for, and you don't are concerned about the thousands of people in that city. That's the way the story ends uh, uh, with Jonah. Then you have Micah. Here you go, guess. Um, Micah lives in the year 750 to about 686. And Micah here mentions at that time Bethlehem, the little one of the cities. Remember that? From a savior is coming. But if anything I have to say about that is 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 just that. But he also prophesies against the destruction of the of the, of the kingdom of the north. Um, then we have Nahum. Nahum. Uh, he prophesies against Syria. I want you to take a look at this. Jonah lives in the years 793 to 753, and the people of Nineveh converted. 100 years almost went by. Now we are looking at 660. No, no, 100 years. Not even that. It's almost. 26 years. And they went back to sin. To, so at this time, God sends Nahum to prophesy against Syria for going back to their sin. The repentance lasted for a, for a little while. And then uh, there is uh, uh, asking for. So uh, that's Nahum, Nahum uh, um, calling Assyria and Nineveh to repentance again. Should have gone into a fish, probably would have been better for him. But then we have Habakkuk. Habakkuk comes to a point and says, God, there's a lot of injustice and immorality and a horrible things are happening in America, the Democrats and the Republic. No. He says, Jerusalem and Judah is really a mess. Would you, God, help us, help us, correct this nation? And God says, yes, thank you very much. I thought that you were never going to ask. I am going to send you the Babylonians, who are a terrible nation, uh, fighters that will destroy even your children, will throw into the rocks. Okay, he said, wait a second. 
are you going to use people worse than we are to destroy us? Less just than we? How do you like that question? And God says, yes, yes. They will be my instruments of discipline. I just pray that God use this, what is happening now with this pandemic, as an instrument of discipline. People, God calling people to the Lord. So Abacock stands there and says, I'm going to see this, but the just shall live by faith. And guess what? That's justification by faith that Paul uses in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. See, justification by faith alone. And then it, it says, I'm going to trust the law. I am going to live by faith. And even if there is no fruits on the trees, and if there is no carol, I will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord. That's uh, Habakkuk. Then we have Zephaniah, uh, the year 635 to 625. He, he talks about the, the day of the Lord. And he uh, talks about uh, when people repent and, 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 and comes to the Lord and what the people do, the children of God, the church, God says, ready for this? He will be so joyful that he will sing of joy when we behave. Imagine God singing. What a motivation for us to behave. Let's make God sing of joy. But he also, uh, goes strong against syncretism. You know what that is when a pagan religious united with God's religion and for the sake of friendship they, they, they give up. God hates syncretism. It's what we call ecumenism today. For the sake of peace between us and joy and love, you know what? To believe in another God, I believe in another God, it's okay. Let's be friends and all of us who worship the same God. That is exactly what some religions are doing today. If you read the Roman Catholic catechism, and I hate to go there, it says that the Muslims worship the same God that we have. It is not. And that the Jewish people are our brothers because are the chosen people of God, even though they don't believe that Jesus is divine, is the Messiah. That's syncretism. You see syncretism when the towers of Manhattan fell and people pray everywhere, different people from different religions got together to pray, but they refuse to pray in the name of whom? Of Jesus, because Jesus was the enemy. That's syncretism. That's ecumenism. Okay, I think you're going to remember Zephaniah. <laughs> it's big on that. Then um, we have uh, Haggai. Haggai is now a a prophet that comes after the exile. He returns uh, to, uh, in the year 520, uh, in, uh, he, with Malachi and Zechariah, uh, motivates people to rebuild the temple and to be faithful to God and to start the new Jerusalem uh, after the return of the exile. Uh, and that is the year 520, we are getting close to the year 400 when the Old Testament ends. Uh, and then we have Zechariah. Zechariah 
is uh, also of the same time, 480 to 470, something like that. I was not there when it happened, so I don't have the right date, but it's very close. Some people say 445 is really getting close to the year 400 when God stops talking from the Old Testament and he doesn't talk again until the New Testament. It's the intertestamental period that is coming. But Zechariah is very interesting. Zechariah sees a whole a number of visions and sees the priest Joshua with dirty clothes. Remember him? That's us. And then he takes the dirty clothes out of us and, and dresses with the new clean clothes. Actually, they're red and beautiful. The blood of the Lord Jesus. The righteousness. And he also sees Jesus. Uh, he says, they will look upon the one that they, um, how do you call that? Peers. They have peers. They will see, uh, they will see your king entering into Jerusalem, uh, riding a donkey, a fall of a donkey. Remember that? It sounds familiar, isn't it? He also says uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, references to the Lord Jesus. And when you read the New Testament, you are going to find that so clearly and distinctly in Zechariah. Zechariah also motivates the people of Israel to be faithful, to listen to the law that Ezra, Ezra was teaching them and to obey and to rebuild the temple. Um, then we have Malachi. And he is the last prophet of the last testament. And he uh, actually has a complaint against the priest who and the people who had been stealing from God. The gospel of prosperity know this prophet very well because that's the way they steal money. Because they say, ha ha, you are robbing God. But, well, I have news for you. Preachers, those pastors are robbing God. Because they rob God from the pulpit. They don't teach the word of God. They teach stories. They steal the time that the people spend there to worship and listen to the word of God. But in this particular case, he says, you are you are bringing to the temple what is something that is damaged, animals that are bad. You, you are throwing uh, your coins as you throw it to a, to a dog there, to a piece of bread to a dog. But he claims that people are supposed to support the church, support the missions, to make sure that the pastors have a salary and also implies that the church has the obligation to give a, uh, an account to the, to the church for how did they spend their money and how they, uh, all the, the expenses and things like that uh, and, and give a, an account for the money. Uh, so uh, this won't work for the prosperity gospels. They don't want to hear that. But he also, Malachi says, I God hates what? Divorce. But then Jesus, uh, that's very serious because then Jesus has an exception clause for divorce and he also shows that there are, that there are divorces that are biblical divorce. And even though whatever divorce is, is not the pardonable sin. When someone has divorced unbelief and comes to Christ, that sin and every other sin has been paid in full and God receives that person where he found Jesus as 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You have to read it and don't allow to be condemned for the sins of the past, you are a new creature, a new creation, you know, 
and you become an ambassador for Christ, going into the world saying, God has freed me from all of that. So now I can show the glory of God, I can show the gospel. Uh, so um, don't let anything condemn you. The only sin that is not, cannot be forgiven is what? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And R.C. Sproul says, I have bad news and good news. Do you want to hear the good news first? He says, no, let me give you the bad news first. The bad news is that every Christian is capable of committing the sin of blasphemy. And the good news is that every Christian cannot commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because God has saved you and he doesn't change his mind. <laughs> and the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the lack of unbelief. Is when someone is exposed to the power of the Holy Spirit, listening to the gospel, hear the gospel clearly and distinctly, like in Hebrews chapter 10, and rejects the gospel and dies without accepting the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And that ain't going to happen, will not happen, does not happen to any Christian because we have been given assurance of salvation by a God that is immutable. There are two other uh, prophets that we didn't mention, but we uh, had to mention. One is Elijah and Elijah and Elijah. And they were prophets that lived in the year 874 and 848 in the Northern Kingdom. And these prophets had a lot to do with a very ugly, bad king. What was his name? Ahab. And uh, when Elijah did about seven miracles and actually uh, condemned the actions of the kings of the north, especially Ahab, then Elijah told him, I said, do you have anything to ask? He says, may I ask the Lord to give me double of the spirit of what he has given you. And guess what? And to hear something interesting? Elijah did seven miracles. Do you want to know how many miracles Elijah did? Do you know that? Double. How much is that? Fourteen. It's, <laughs> it's very interesting. So uh, with that, we finish the Old Testament. Uh, and we have 25 minutes. We can jump into the New Testament. Uh, 400 years passed from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and I am going to give you a test that RC gives to his, gave to his students quite often, and the question is, what is the last prophet of the Old Testament? John the Baptist. You have an A. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? We think that is Malachi, but it's John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist announced the coming of the kingdom. So the New Testament, the inauguration of the New Testament is with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not with the coming of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist announced that. It's, it is interesting that even in Malachi ends by saying the prophet will be coming in the spirit. No, he says, Elijah will be coming before the day of the Lord, before the coming of the Lord Jesus. See, now in Matthew, Matthew there are four, for the people who are listening here, uh, uh, that there are four. Gospels. 
Three of them are synoptic gospels because they are very parallel, very similar. There's Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And there is then the Gospel of John that doesn't follow that equivalent to the others, uh, the way the three synoptic Gospels do. Uh, but since I talk about John the Baptist, let me get this warm out of here. Uh, uh, Jesus says, John the Baptist, this is Elijah, if you are willing to accept, that was announced to come. And then they ask John the Baptist and they say, are you Elijah? And he says, no. Who is right? Jesus or John the Baptist? Both are right. Why? Because the solution is found in the book of Luke where uh, Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, received the announcement that he is going to have a son and the angel Gabriel solves the problem between the Lord Jesus and John the Baptist. He says he will come in the spirit of Elijah. See, for the pagans we like to see that reincarnation exists because Jesus said he's Elijah. But Jesus meant, if you are willing, if you can understand that. So it's very clear. Well, comes the book of Matthew. Matthew writes for the Jewish people and brings Jesus as the king. And begins with the genealogy of the Lord Jesus under Joseph, who has the authority over the house of uh, Jesus in the house of Mary and his brothers. So it is taken that that's the way it is. And you see all, many of these people that we mentioned in the genealogy to make sure that Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah in uh, all of that. In verse 21, it says, and she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Listen to this. For he will save everyone. Is that what it says there? No. He will save his people from their sins. It's not for everyone. It's for the chosen people of God. The sheep that God has sent his son to rescue. So that verse is extremely important. Uh, you can see uh, Matthew quoting the Old Testament like never you see. The virgin, behold, the virgin shall be with child, as from Isaiah, verse uh, uh, 23, and so on. Uh, then Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and that fulfills the prophecy also of um, Micah. And, um, and then uh, we see not, not only the humiliation of the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, but we see the humiliation of the persecution of Jesus, even before he is born. The angel has to say, which is the baby that is in, the, uh, in Mary, is you cannot have Mary stone. You will kill the baby, <laughs> basically. You know, but it's already an attack on the baby. But it's interesting also with, um, with, uh, John the Baptist, that the Bible says that the baby received the Holy Spirit before the baby was born and was predestined to do this. And it's talking about the baby, not the fetus, the baby. So abortion is not just 
killing a fetus, fetus, but it is killing a baby. Uh, then uh, in uh, chapter uh, three of Matthew, uh, we see the baptism of Jesus and John the Baptist has this glorious moment of standing in front of the Holy Trinity. He hears the voice of the Father. He sees the Holy Spirit coming down and he's in front of the second person of the Trinity. Enough to give your head for that. You know, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing seeing the glory of Christ. And then uh, Jesus in chapter 4 is taken to be tempted by the devil, but is carried by the Holy Spirit. For that reason is the ministry of the Holy Spirit that comes. I'm so glad to have um, Dr. Sinclair Ferguson uh, next Saturday. Uh, where, um, given a lecture through SRL seminary in South America with me. Uh, and I love when he talks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I love this part. He says, when Jesus, you know, I, will, I, will, I love this English. When Jesus arrives in heaven in his glory and is receiving a tremendous party, and the father says, well done, my son. Great. And he says, daddy, I did your will. And I'd like you to fulfill now what you promised me. What did I promise you, son? You promised me to send the counselor. You promised me to send the Holy Spirit. I says, oh yeah. In 10 days, <laughs> you know, and sends the Holy Spirit in Pentecost. Of course, this, this is not what the Bible says. That's what right, Sinclair Ferguson explained. But isn't that beautiful, though? It just make you... In any event, he's tempted, and at the temptation of Jesus, Jesus refutes Satan with the Bible. He says, it is written, it is written, it is written. And Satan gets frustrated and says, but it's also written. <laughs> he attacks Jesus also with the Bible, using it out of context. That's exactly what the enemies of the Bible do today in the pastors who are not doing. And then it comes from chapter five to chapter seven, a tremendous discourse of the Lord Jesus that is called the Sermon on the Mount. And here Jesus says, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it completely. And he raises the bar of the Ten Commandments. It had been said to you, you shall not kill. But I say to you, that if you speak evil of your brother, you have killed your brother. They haven't said, do not commit adultery. That in Exodus 20. And then he says, but I tell you, that if you have impure thoughts, you already have committed adultery. And so it just raises the bar. And then you have the Beatitudes there. It's a tremendous uh, passage. Uh, you have... Uh, a number of uh, uh, this. This is a uh, this, this is a sermon that could be you. You have to read it in one sitting and really look at the beauty, the uh, the uh, prescription for sanctification. You have. Uh, Salvation is once for all when we are regenerated and we are born again. And then comes the process of sanctification and the Lord Jesus here presents this magnificent process of sanctification. 
And then you have uh, the number of miracles that Jesus does beginning in chapter eight. And uh, uh, he also, remember, calms the seas when he is, uh, he walks on the sea, that's once, and the other time he is sleeping inside the boat. And both times the disciples are greatly afraid because of the torment of the sea. But then when they see Jesus with the power over nature, they become even more afraid. And uh, when you see that, you have to go back to Job 38, 39, 40. You know, when you see the power of God creating the mountains, creating everything, creating the constellation, creating, even says that the world is round. We didn't discover that until Galilee. <laughs> you know, and yet, you see that power, that business of combing the waters is a piece of cake. You know, after he is the... Uh, mm. And then, uh, then they bring Jesus to a, bring him a paralytic. And after so many efforts to bring him down, uh, he encounters him and said, instead of healing him right there, he says, your sins are forgiven. He says, who is that man who forgives sins? Only God does. And he says, okay, so you'll see that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. Get up, take bed and go. Oh, I, I, I would have loved to see that. I would love to see them open a hole on the, on the roof, bringing him down. It takes, it takes four people to take him to Jesus. How many do we need to take us to Jesus? The dangerous thing is to wait until four or six men take anyone to church after their end without going to Jesus. It takes at least six men. Six, well, for me, that I'm tall and short, so four men will be sufficient. But, okay. Uh, then Jesus, uh, in chapter 10, after many miracles, he wants to send his disciples and he says, go. And he tells very much the same thing that happened to Isaiah and that happened to Jeremiah and to Ezekiel. Go and you are going to have a great time. Everyone is going to welcome you. They are going to kiss you. They are going to give you hot chocolate, even Colombian coffee. No. Go, but they will not receive you. They will hate you. They will they will persecute you, but don't you worry, I will be with you always. And if they persecute me, uh, why you worry about being persecuted? Just confess me, because if you confess me in front of men, I will confess you in front of my angels and my Father in heaven. And then, um, the Pharisees begin to attack Jesus in it horrible way, and uh, Jesus began to unmask them uh, little by little. And finally, uh, not finally, but then in chapter 13, he presents a number of parables. <clears throat> and the first parable, as you know, is the sowing of the seeds. And when he finished teaching this parable, The disciples said, what do you mean by that? They don't understand. He says, that's the reason I speak in parables. So the ones who are not chosen by God, they will not understand. The ones who do not have ears to hear and eyes to see, and let me quote you Isaiah. <laughs> it's amazing in every gospel in John chapter 12 verse 37 he quotes against Isaiah 
because they will not hear. The, God has to open their eyes. It's not any one of us who is going to be saved for our own account. It's God who saves us. He, remember John, came to his own and his own received him not. But, one eleven, as many as received him, to them he gave him the right to be children of God. Anyone who doesn't trust in Christ is not a child of God. Period. You can mention God as many times as you want. <clears throat> if we don't believe in Christ alone for our salvation, we are not children of God. But it gets better. Verse 13. The ones who believe is not because they were children of Christians. Not because of blood. Blood. No, I'm speaking like Dracula blood. Not because of blood. Not because of the will of men. Not because I want to. Not because somebody comes and says, repeat this little sentence. Not because of the will of the flesh. I can not believe. There are three little words there at the end. But of God. God is in charge of the salvation. If you want to take it a little farther, you go to John 44, where it says, how many can believe? None. No one can come to me. What is the necessary condition? Unless the Father grabs them, take them. In uh, 665, well, I'm, I'm not ready in John. Let me finish with Matthew. <laughs> but it is an amazing thing how he presents the, uh, the parables in, uh, in chapter 13 and in chapter and, and, and about heaven and so on. And in chapter uh, 14, obviously, Jesus walks on the sea and John the Baptist is beheaded. And uh, in chapter uh, um, 16, uh, that there are a multitude of people healed, and you remember the faith of the Canaan, uh, Canaanite woman, and um, then you arrive in chapter 17, and it's the transfiguration. They say, we have 10 minutes, almost gone. Um, the transfiguration, just breathe and rest quickly, because we are going to finish on time, not like Latin American time, American time. And the American says, Dutch time. In any event, <laughs> the transfiguration, Jesus takes these three disciples and goes into the mountain and is transfigured. And they see again the glory of Jesus. And they hear the voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. It is interesting that Peter writes about that situation. And he says, we saw the beauty of Christ and we saw that vision, but that is not sufficient for you to believe. What did he say? You have something more sure. What is it? The written word of God that was given to holy men. And those men did not wrote of their own interpretation. They wrote what was expired by the Holy Spirit. Inspired to them by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting. But here, you see that after all, Moses got into the promised land because he was there with Jesus. It's just a little insight. Uh, he appeared with Elijah and Moses in the Mount of Transfiguration. Mimi told me not to tell jokes. Okay, so I will not do it. Uh, then he talks 
the parable of the lost sheep. He did not come to save goats. There is no transition from goats to sheep. He came to save the lost sheep. Father, I came for the lost sheep. You came to me, and those are the ones that I saved. And then he tells a lot of parables of uh, uh, the rich young ruler or man, the parable of the vineyard, uh, the, uh, the, the blind man healed, and um, the triumphant enter, en entry into Jerusalem, and um, uh, the parable of the wedding feast, that you have to be properly dressed with um, sola fide, with justification by faith before you can go to the banquet. And then in parable 24, he go after the Pharisees and say, whoa, you Pharisees, the right race of vipers, you know, and you, uh, you proclaim with your lips, but your heart is a far away from me, quoted actually from the prophets. And he really unmasked, he calls them fools and blind, for which is greater than the court. But, and he goes on uh, dealing with the Pharisees, and then we arrive in chapter 24. Chapter 24, he gives the Olivet Discourse. And there, in the Olive Discourse, he uh, uh, tells about the end of the world. And uh, the, in so many ways, he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD, because some of these things won't happen, uh, will happen in this generation. And uh, uh, he talks about the end of the world, and he says, and they ask him, when will that happen? And what does he say? I don't know. But you are the son of God. You should know. Say, I don't know. Why? There's two natures. The human nature and the divine nature. And the divine nature informs the human nature. And at that particular case, only God had, Father had that. So any, any charlatan that comes around telling us when the last day is going to be, you know, don't believe. In fact, Jesus says, be careful not to believe anybody because many will come telling you things to deceive you, to deceive even who? The chosen one to deceive even the elect. And then he adds something. It does not appear yet. If that was possible, nobody, absolutely nobody, can deceive the Christians because we never lose our salvation. He continues to give more parables about the kingdom. Um, and uh, in chapter uh, 26, he explained the difference between the sheep and the goats and what is going to happen at the last day, that he will separate the sheep from the goats. And um, so on. then uh, finally comes the prayer in Gethsemane, the last, the Thursday before uh, his death. And he says, Daddy, Daddy, if it is possible, pass this cup from me. He say, Father, if there is any other way to save anybody, do not kill me. Don't make me drink the sins of all the people who are going to believe in me. That's why you have other things there, you have the priest, you have your words, you have the purgatory, you have this, no. The answer was no, there is no other way. And he was there looking 
it, uh, you wish to be there. On the right hand, depends on the position that he was, you'll see the Mount of Olives. On the other hand, you see the Mount of Calvary is there, knowing that from the olive he will go to heaven, and from Calvary he will suffer. He was saying, Daddy, Daddy, Father, don't do it. But not my will, but your will, because that's what I came to do. Your will. And then the next day, he is at the cross. And he doesn't say, Daddy. He says, he's in front of a judge. He is judging with his wrath all our sin. And the wrath of God came upon him instead of us. And he says in front of that judge, my God, my God, why? Wow. Did you have mentioned our name? But he didn't say anything. And when everything was finished, he said, it is finished, it is completed. And he goes back to the relationship with daddy. He says, daddy, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Wow, <laughs> it, is, it is magnificent. And the veil of the temple ripped apart and through the veil of the body of Jesus, we can go directly to God without any intercessor but the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing. And then he resurrects. And then he is ready to ascend into heaven and said, No, eh? And put your name in there. The only reason why I save you is because of the covenant. And I save you, so you will go and present this gospel in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in France, in South America, in Asia, to the ends of the world. The Great Commission. And if anyone is embarrassed of my gospel, out of me, I will be embarrassed in front of my daddy. He says, and Paul says in Romans 1, because I am not ashamed of the gospel. What is the gospel? Jesus, the person of Jesus and his work. Because it is the power of God unto salvation for whom? those who believe for the Jew and for the and for the not Jew see it's the because justification will be by faith alone in this Jesus that God will and will see clearly the next time that we meet when we review a little bit of the Old Testament and see Jesus and every page of the Bible. And that Jesus, justification by faith alone, because he quotes Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to arrive to your magnificent gospel of Matthew. Oh Lord, our God, how wonderful is your plan of salvation. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts higher than our thoughts. Who could invent a plan of salvation so perfect? It is with gratitude that we approach your book and we thank you 
for allowing us to have ears to hear, and eyes to see, and hearts to understand. Thank you for the regeneration that you have given us to trust in Christ alone for our salvation. And it is in his name that we thank you. Amen. Okay, I hope you come back on the 22nd and we'll go through the rest. It's, it is, it is, it is a gift from God. That's for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go? Can I go? Oh, yeah.